Okay, sports fans, it is time to get started. So welcome to the eighth International Symposium on Focused Ultrasound. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it is an absolute thrill to see everybody in person again after four years. And I also want to thank those who have joined virtually. So the purpose of the symposium is threefold. First is to create knowledge by sharing data and information. The second is to foster collaboration and innovation through personal relationships. And the third is to have fun. Now I would be the last to represent that North Bethesda is the best location to have fun. In contrast to Leon in April for ISTU, where we will have fun, Cyril told me that the tagline for ISTU in April is fun disguised as science. So we look forward to seeing you all there. So in an attempt to accomplish all three, we've done an experiment. And this is the first iteration of the experiment. And we're trying to reimagine how scientific meetings are going to be conducted in the digital era using internet technologies. So we have a dual, dual track, in person and virtual. We've eliminated the poster session. All presentations are pre-recorded and will be continuously available. We're trying to focus on discussion and debate of hot topics through 27 panel discussions of experts. And we provided what we hope is a robust mechanism for you to interact with all of the authors and panelists through the app and the platform. We've provided extensive time for networking, both at the breakfasts and the lunches and the breaks and we've added a reception at the end of every day for mingling. We've intentionally left the evenings entirely free. Let me reiterate that this is an experiment. It's the first step in an iterative process, and we solicit your feedback, which we will do after the meeting. But in particular, the most vexing question for us is this symposium, the International Symposium, is it still valuable or is it outdated and an anachronist, an anachronism? Have we been overtaken by other meetings that include focused ultrasound as an important part of their program, particularly those associated with the various clinical societies? In any case, in the next year, in, this, in, the, in the following two years, we will provide an increased number of in-person workshops and virtual roundtables. In closing, I would ask that all of you join me in recognizing and appreciating the Foundation's incredible all-star team that has brought you this symposium, that organizes the workshops and meetings that funds your research, that produces the webinars and podcasts and blogs, publishes the newsletter, the focus feature in the state of the field, and provides internships and fellowships. Can all the members of the foundation's team, anybody who's on the doll, can, anybody, can you all stand and be recognized? And in particular, I'd like to recognize or give a shout out to Emily Whipple and Robin Jones. Are they in the room or are they outside? Emily Whipple and Robin Jones, who have suffered the most from my words of encouragement in the last months. And it also our amazing IT team, the communications team, and the research and education team. So thank all of you for this effort. 
Now, Alisa. Uh, Alisa. So on behalf of the foundation, it gives me enormous pleasure to present Alisa Kona Fagu as the honorary president of the symposium. Alisa is well known to all of us. And by any and all measure, she is a leader in focused ultrasound for which she has attained the highest or most prominent position in the pantheon of focused ultrasound. She is a highly regarded academician, but also entrepreneur. Her career has been devoted to using her engineering background to create innovative technical solutions for a variety of difficult clinical problems. She's been extraordinarily successful in addressing every element of the value chain, beginning with the identification of unmet clinical needs and then developing an idea and translating that into a preclinical device for, clinical, for uh, laboratory studies and then producing a clinical version for patient treatment and clinical trials. And then finally, creating companies that will enable the technology to be widely accessible to patients. But most importantly, and the reason Alisa was selected as the honorary president, is that she is the quintessential role model for educating and inspiring and motivating young people in the field. I've known Alisa for many years, and I continue to be astonished by how so, someone who's so young can have accomplished so much. So Elisa, will you come share some secrets with us? Thank you, Neil. And it is Liza. No. <laughs> Just to confuse you further. No, it's a, you, you did amazingly. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good morning. And uh, Neil almost made me cry, so I'm going to get right to it. Um, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, I have been coming to this uh, symposium for 10 years now. And I have been thrilled every time, so I hope that for those of you who it's your first time, you're as thrilled as I was uh, the first time and a lot of times after that. So I'll talk uh, about the work that's been going on in my lab for almost 20 years now, uh, and specifically for how we can use ultrasound to immunomodulate, neuromodulate, uh, drug deliver, and finally some ablation, which was the original um, idea about using focused ultrasound in the clinic. Um, so we all know about focused ultrasound. It's a very uh, simple idea. You have to focus the sound in a specific region, and the physics is kind, as we all know, and we can leave the rest of the tissues intact. So this is also not a new idea. It has been around for a long, long time. We know piezoelectrics were... Uh, invented the, uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century by the Curie, br uh, discovered by the Curie brothers, uh, then put uh, into, um, uh, there's a 1905 nature paper that I don't have here where they were used on bees, so I'm going to skip that because I know we have some veterinarians here, and then get right to um, about almost a century ago where it was used for cellular disruption, uh, then cavitation, and then all that good stuff that uh, led us to understanding more, especially in the 20s and 30s of the last century, how we can use uh, the, some of the properties to, um, of ultrasound in the tissues and to elicit uh, biological effects. And this is a very famous video. I don't, I'm not going to play it uh, for those of you who know it. Uh, it's a very interesting video from the 50s of the Fry brothers at the Urbana Champaign University of Illinois campus where they're able to, to do neurosonic surgery. So back in the 50s, this was uh, a very groundbreaking thing. 
So fast forward to this century, and, uh, and thanks to this foundation and a lot of work that has been done uh, from people in this room and also virtually who are not here with us, uh, there has been a series of back-to-back uh, -back approvals uh, for starting with the and fibroids to bone metastasis, palliative treatments, prostate cancer, essential tremors, and then I think most recently, uh, the uh, osteoid osteoma. And a lot of companies that uh, have been uh, amazingly groundbreakers, innovators, and I'm only listing a few of them here that have gotten these approvals. And back to, uh, unfortunately, the poster session that we really like, and I know Neil took it away from us, but uh, that was back uh, in 2014, and this is my former student, Marilena Karakatsani, who met the, uh, the current president of the, of the, of the United States, uh, uh, Joe Biden, in front of her poster. And it was her first conference uh, in the US, and that's how you do it. You know, you come to the Focus Ultrasound Symposium, and you meet the future president. You just barely landed from Greece. So, <laughs> but now these poster sessions don't exist anymore. So, and of course, this has to do with the uh, moonshot, the cancer moonshot that was launched I believe later uh, that year, um, and, and of course there's a session in the conference about that. So what was Marilena talking to President Biden about? Uh, I'm gonna start with that, which is a drug delivery through the blood-brain barrier, and uh, the idea is to um, use uh, microbubbles uh, with the focused ultrasound beam and be able to relax uh, the blood-brain barrier which sits in all our, all our brain blood vessels and is responsible for filtering uh, toxic molecules, but also drugs, unfortunately. So to relax it enough, uh, like uh, Gail said yesterday, to control the cavitation effect that is happening and be able to just allow the drugs to penetrate through and affect uh, tissues such as the neurons and stop them from degenerating. Um, so this is what MRI can do for us, contrast enhanced, and can show us uh, where we have the enhanced um, the uh, enhanced uh, regions on the MRI, we can see where we opened. In this case, we opening in a mouse uh, in the substantial nigra grand they called it putamen, uh, because these are, this is the dop dopaminergic neuron that's actually affecting, um, uh, affected by early Parkinson's disease. And uh, the idea was to uh, be able to, and this is the dopaminergic neuron again, uh, the idea is to try to have it restore. Uh, with, through the use of uh, uh, neurotrophic factors, uh, such as neutrin, and, and I'm gonna show you later the gene delivery. So we used the model, we collaborated uh, with Serge Persborski's group at Columbia that uh, depletes terminals, axons, and dendrites, um, and then we tried to see how much of that can be restored. So <clears throat> the only thing that actually changed things, and this is what I'm showing you uh, on the one region called the striatum, uh, in uh, where the terminals of the neurons are projecting, uh, the only way that we can actually have them restored, and what you see in brown in the bottom right is actually the restoration, is through opening the blood brain barrier and having this uh, neuro uh, neurotrophic factor penetrate through, and we can restore the terminals by 50% uh, with uh, allowing the drug to go through through three weekly sessions, uh, weekly sessions of that uh, uh, blood brain barrier opening. So the other way that you can have the neuron restore itself is actually be able to transduce uh, the gene that expresses uh, the neurotrophic factor. So we've been doing this work uh, for a lot of years. Uh, our group was one, uh, the first to actually see focused ultrasound with gene delivery. And uh, this is a GFP, a green fluorescent protein, that if it expresses in a neuron, it turns the neuron green, as you can see on the left and it, it, it co-localizes mainly with neurons <clears throat> at 95%. And then we wanted to see how, if we have the gene expressing the, the, the neurotrophic protein, very similar to what we did uh, in the protein uh, weekly sessions that we had in the mouse model, the same mouse model, we actually see that you can have in the substantia nigra where the cell bodies are, on the left is where we actually sonicated with focus ultrasound and, and allowed the gene delivery vector to go through. And on the right is the contralateral side, which you can see that there's a, a big depletion uh, of the dendrites of the neuron. And that was significant. 
<clears throat> and then this made uh, the cover of a journal of controlled release uh, uh, three years ago now about how we can restore 50% uh, of the terminals with the protein alone and 76% uh, of the dendrites with one uh, gene delivery, uh, uh, with one gene delivery um, session. Uh, before I go to the tumors, uh, uh, we are actually gearing up for a Parkinson's trial, uh, which we hope uh, that we can get uh, within the next couple of years to do this in humans. So <clears throat> with the uh, other groups at Columbia, we, we're very uh, lucky to have amazing clinical collaborators, uh, Fred Wu and Sergio Zaharoulis, who I think they're not here. Um, <clears throat> we actually started uh, diffuse midline glioma, which is uh, one of the deadliest, if not the deadliest, cancer in kids, in pediatric patients. And uh, we use a toposide, uh, which is uh, a drug that's actually generic, <clears throat> and we found that in mice that had the uh, diffuse midline glioma, we can uh, increase the concentration by, by eight to ten times. And when you do that, um, you can actually have uh, uh, serious uh, uh, tumor uh, shrinkage uh, uh, and, uh, and survival extension. We also use another more recent drug that's actually uh, orally administered called panobinostat. And uh, with focused ultrasound, we saw also very uh, good control of the tumors, so the same tumors in mice. So then we went to the FDA and we got the, uh, the IDE approval to do this in uh, uh, in uh, diffuse midline glioma patients, and I'm going to show you the results, uh, some of the results later on, bef be when I get to the clinical studies. Before that, uh, I want to also introduce what we can do with ultrasound, focused ultrasound, to um, alert immune cells uh, in, in the brain. So uh, this is a, an explosion of, um, of, a, of a field, and I'm going to only talk about what we're doing uh, in our group, but there's a lot of uh, people in this group that are also going to be the panel discussions in this meeting about this. So <clears throat> uh, we have these immune cells in, in our brain. Um, uh, some of them are called uh, macroglia, and, um, and we have, uh, these are alerted, but we don't know exactly how, but they're alerted by the focused ultrasound. They're mechanosensitive cells, so they're actually uh, crawling into our brain uh, quite, uh, and trying to find where debris or toxic molecules may be in our brain. So they're, they know how to sense uh, mechanical um, effects, and after opening the brain, they're even more alert to that. So we can uh, image them, as you see in, uh, in pink colors here. This is a macroglia that has their processes uh, that are um, uh, uh, propagating uh, into, into the tissue, and that helps them move uh, to the region where the injury happened. And uh, Robin G, who's uh, in the audience, has shown that uh, it increases uh, we can, with the cavitation response. And uh, in fact, we can have different profiles of this inflammation uh, at different time points. And if we put them all together, there's a lot of proteins here, and chemokines or cytokines that are actually get expressed. But the main takeaway is that after um, uh, after uh, uh, 72 hours, uh, some of the chemokines, cytokines are, are, um, uh, that are pro-inflammatory are uh, subsiding, and then you have even more interesting uh, aspect, which is basically the anti-inflammatory aspects, where through the repair mechanism of the barrier, so these are, uh, this is a, a process that repairs the barrier after opening, uh, we also have the cascade of effects that are uh, beneficial for pathology uh, reduction. And more recently, Alina klein uh in our group has shown that there's two types of macrophages, so these are other uh, immune cells that are actually coming uh, from the central nervous system, but also disease-associated macrophages that are the ones that are reducing pathology. And those are keep increasing after three days, and they are responsible for phagocytosing uh, some of the uh, aspects uh, that we see in Alzheimer's, such as uh, tau, what I'm showing you here, tau is actually in green, uh, red is the macroglia, and you can see on the, on the right that the two coincide, meaning that uh, the actual uh, macroglia is phagocytosing the tau or um, breaking down the tau as a result of the opening of the blood-brain barrier. Uh, that's for the tau alone, but we also seen the same effect on amyloid, on beta amyloid, amyloid beta 40 and amyloid beta 42 uh, in an Alzheimer's mouse model. And this is uh, the, uh, 
the Western blot that showed the tau reduction uh, in that uh, amyloid and tau expressed in the Alzheimer's mouse model. And what's even more interesting, and we're looking at that very closely, especially uh, in both mice and patients, is that we can reduce uh, the amyloid and tau and have improvement uh, of one of the working memory tests called Morris Water Maze. And you can see that uh, on the bottom uh, panel, uh, the one on the right, uh, the red dot is where you want the mouse to find this platform where it has a cue and remembers that this is the platform while it's swimming in that, in that pool of water um, uh, to save itself from drowning, while the mouse on the left is the one that cannot find the platform and you have red, uh, red spots across other regions. So that means that it could not remember where the platform was. So we can uh, affect memory and also reduce pathology with just the opening of the blood brain barrier alone. So what makes it fascinating is, can we go from preclinical to clinical? And I know a lot of you understand the difficulties and how a lot of things stay in the labs and don't get to the clinic, and that's actually one of the um, breakthroughs that uh, the foundation has helped us make. So I'm gonna try to be brief. Um, so we actually did translate this to the clinic uh, recently. Um, we use MRI offline, so this is available of the, of the subject that we want to open the barrier. Uh, we target uh, uh, first uh, with, um, uh, with the infrared camera that you see here uh, through a new navigation. We plan uh, the actual uh, treatment uh, through simulations that have three-dimensional uh, rendering of the skull, making sure that we can get through the skull and th into the brain. And then we can monitor with cavitation mapping, so we, uh, we have done this, uh, I don't have time to show th uh, this right now, and then go to contrast-enhanced MRI after the fact and making sure that we open the region that we tend into. This is what our system looks like. Uh, we use an infrared camera that uh, registers the fa uh, some of the uh, facial features of the subject with the ultrasound, and then you know where the crosshairs are on the left, uh, how, uh, where we're gonna target. And the whole treatment right now takes under uh, 30 minutes. Uh, this is our first Alzheimer's patient a couple of years back, almost to the day. And, um, and this is the subject after the treatment with the team at the time. Um, and uh, our, um, our positioner is, uh, it can be done with a robotic arm or with a, uh, with a, uh, with a positioner. And uh, we have the cavitation uh, detection in real time as well as the mapping. So this is our opening. It's all with a single element, um, and, but we can open within 300 cubic millimeters in that patient. And then we can have also, similar to what we saw in the mice, uh, some amyloid reduction, very temporary. Uh, temporary. Uh, we do this with PET, and you can see in C, in the C panel, where we opened in A, it coincides with some of the green region which shows uh, the asymmetric uh, SUVR decrease. Catherine Liu from our lab is going to present that on Thursday as part of her investigator award. And uh, this didn't happen in all the patients, and it didn't last. So you can see that in the spider plot, it happened in uh, three out of the uh, six patients. Actually, the one in green is a control. Uh, so th uh, three out of the five that where we had opening. And, but the amyloid uh, increased again. So that means that we will have to have uh, uh, some uh, weekly sessions, if monthly sessions, of amyloid um, uh, effects, uh, reduction effects, um, in order to be able to, to do this right. And going back to the pediatric tumors, uh, we have done four subjects uh, with uh, the pontan glioma, so these are the pons, uh, uh, between the, the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, so you have uh, a different positioning uh, of the transducer. And we were able to open, again, with a single element in the palms where the arrow is showing. Um, and, uh, and this is the, uh, the, the team and the patient in the chair after the treatment. Um, the final thing I want to talk about is neuromodulation. So can we use ultrasound without bubbles and without drugs? And can we actually have an effect uh, on the brain and the peripheral nervous system? And the answer, as most of you know, is yes. And uh, we don't exactly know the mechanism, but it definitely works. And this is some of the first mouse work that we did. You can see on the uh, left hind paw here, a little bit of a twitch of the mouse as we are uh, targeting um, the, the visual cortex in this case. 
And, um, and we were able to map uh, the motor responses uh, one millimeter below the skull in the mouse and then the sensory responses uh, three millimeters uh, below the skull. And we, one of the advantages that we have uh, with imaging uh, with ultrasound is that you can also real-time image whether it's a displacement, the radiation force that's emitted by the wave, cavitation, um, and we're doing also some thermal uh, measurements uh, ma based on the uh, speed of sound. Here I'm showing a thermocouple response. Um, and what we can do is also use this imaging to uh, target better and also uh, elicit the responses that we want. Uh, we're looking at neuropathic pain uh, treatment, uh, and that's the work by Stephen Lee and Erica McCune that are also here in this audience. Uh, we work with surgeons such as Chris Winfrey, also at Columbia in neurosurgery. And uh, we have post-surgical subjects where we poke uh, the region where they actually feel the pain and then we target the nerve that's associated with that pain. And you can see uh, that video is running as like a rainbow uh, colors is basically the displacement radiating inside the leg as a result of focused ultrasound. Now when we do this, uh, we can be on target, we can see whether we have the nerve on our, on our crosshairs or we can be off target. And the responses are very different. When we are on target, then we can see a displacement rising exponentially in the bottom left. Uh, when we're off target, uh, the displacement is much lower, and in fact, uh, we can have the opposite effect. When we have off target, you can see on the bottom right that we can have an increase in the pain sensation as opposed to a decrease in orange where we are on target. So it's very important we find that we target the nerve properly so that we don't have the opposite effect of what we intended. But it does reduce uh, the pain uh, up to a two, uh, 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 two uh, uh, pain um, ratings. And then instead of asking the subjects to rate their pain, uh, we actually can measure with AEG, and that's something that Erica has been doing, and she's gonna present that also on Thursday, uh, as far as also her, uh, the, this, uh, um, Oh, maybe not on Thursday. Maybe you're going to talk about it at the panel. I'm sorry. So, um, and we have seen that you have a suppression in the somatosensory evoked potential from the somatosensory cortex. It's a, a modest suppression, but that only happens when you're on target with a pressure of about 2.5 megapascals, and you can have up to 20% uh, 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 decrease in that sensation of pain at, on the EEG. Last thing, I promise is fast, the breast cancer ablation that we're working on <coughs> for a long time. And I'm going to let um, uh, Judy, Judy Lee, who's also an award uh, talk about it. Um, and Hong Chen has worked also on uh, an alum on, on pancreatic cancer ablation that I don't have time to talk about. But we want to image in real time and also see the ablation, the lesion in, in real time. We do this by modulating the beam uh, with amplitude modulation. Uh, on the order of 50 hertz to 100 hertz. And then that allows us to see the actual beam, where it is, so we localize the beam, and then we start uh, monitoring the lesion based on that vibration. We have built the system that has been uh, approved and is on clinicaltrials.gov as well for breast cancer ablation that's merely wheeled to the bedside and uh, we can actually ablate the tumor that has been detected. Uh, we also have a, a, a breast cancer mouse model, and we can see that uh, the, the tumor gets a very hard. In this case, we use elasticity, uh, the stiffness of the actual tumor that gets rapidly stiffening as a result of the desmoplasia that happens in the tumor. So this is just for the progression of the tumor. And we obviously want this to be ablated as soon as possible. What we do is that we use the actual stiffening that we know is happening through the uh, ablation further stiffening uh, in that focal spot. And so we, modul we modulate, we vibrate and ablate at the same time. And then we uh, can make uh, three-dimensional images of the tumor before and after lesioning. Um, so we can see the tumor both before and after lesioning through the uh, added stiffening. So we have also started a clinical trial here, as I mentioned, uh, with the ablation. And we can see here some of the results that Judy's gonna show on Thursday that we can identify the region of le the lesion on, uh, by processing the, the, the actual B modes where you don't see the, the lesioning on the actual B mode ultrasound image, but you can see it on the, uh, on the stiffening side as the lesion is forming in blue. 
Okay, this is definitely uh, uh, one of my last slides, but not the least. Uh, this, I have been incredibly lucky to have this amazing team, uh, alumni, clinical uh, co-investigators, uh, biologists, uh, immunologists, uh, and, and of course the students and postdocs that have gone through my lab. Uh, NIH has been, uh, and the Focus Out of Sun Foundation, extremely uh, you know, supportive in our work, as well as uh, the other sponsors that you see here. But I want to go back to the Focus Out of Sun Foundation just because I have, it has been an amazing journey going through all these clinical trials and uh, some of the entrepreneurial endeavors that Neil was talking about. And the whole foundation has been amazing, but I want to uh, just say a big thank you to these folks here that I'm going to bug also during this conference further. And it's an absolute pleasure to be in your midst. Thank you. Do I take questions? in here for the moderator of the session. So we're going to move to the Frank Yolich uh, Award, which we announced yesterday, uh, but want to do the uh, award uh, recognition and the, and the talk today. So we, it is a great honor to present this year's Frank Yolich Award. And the Focus on Sound Foundation and Insight Tech put together this award. It gives us another opportunity for us to remember Frank but also to introduce him to the younger generations of scientists and researchers that are joining the field and not, were not fortunate enough to work and, and, and know Frank. Um, the field of focus ultrasound has been blessed with many visionaries and pioneers that paved the way of this therapeutic modality uh, and its pathway to the bedside of patients. Frank was a mentor and a guiding light for many of us. He was born in Hungary and arrived to the US in 1979. He was a neurosurgeon by training and got a residency position at the Department of, of Radiology at Brigham and Women's in Boston. In, later decades, uh, in the later decades of the previous century, medical imaging technologies have shaped their way to become a common necessity in medicine. Frank was a big part of that, as he realized the huge potential for improving patient care through advanced imaging and diagnostics. Frank's personal ambition was to take things beyond what others do and push this technology and imaging technology and innovation to the extreme to keep making things better. With his spirit, he envisioned that the emerging MR imaging modality would not be limited to diagnostics, but can play a huge role in delivering therapy. He was one of the founding fathers of image-guided therapy that became his passion and legacy. He encouraged and motivated MR vendors, scientists, physicians, clinicians, that image-guided surgery is the ultimate way to deliver therapy to patients. In the late 1990s, as focus ultrasound technology developed with the introduction of multiple phased array elements and advanced beamforming electronics, combining non-invasive therapy with non-invasive imaging became possible, and Frank was a big part of that. In the closing of the last century, Insight Tech and Frank shared that vision, together with many other scientists, physicians, and pioneers, paved the way for developing MR-guided focus ultrasound. For almost two decades, we all worked together with him closely to overcome multiple challenges to turn our short vision into the reality we have today. Frank was our guiding light. He was there in our most glorious successes. He was always there when there were tough moments of despair and uncertainty. His clear vision of the future potential, his determination to see through the challenges and never give up, were a fundamental element in establishing what we see here today in our, in our community. Frank left us in 1914. He was fortunate to see this vision or his vision translate into a true robust medical technology and nothing gave him more joy than seeing the benefit it brings to patients. 
Frank also left us with a legacy to continue, continue to explore, expand, and innovate to advance MR-guided focus ultrasound to new frontiers, treat more diseases, and bring more help to more patients. The Focus Ultrasound Foundation, together with Insight Tech, announced the Frank Yolej Award back in 2016 to honor the life achievements of Frank and his work. It is intended to recognize and encourage his innovative spirit in mid-career researchers and clinicians who continue to advance focus ultrasound technology in the field. As one can expect with the growing field, the selection process is becoming tougher and tougher from year to year. We are glad to see that the bar is con consistently getting higher. This year's selection committee reviewed multiple applications and ranked the runners-up with, right, uh, with the right call. The recipient of this year's award, as, you, uh, as we announced yesterday, is Dr. Graham Woodworth, who is here with us today. Graham is a professor and chair of neurosurgery at the University of Maryland School of Medicine uh, and a director of the Brain Tumor Treatment Research Center. His pioneering work in neuro-oncology set the stage for some of the most important advancement in the field. His exceptional academic work spans from basic mechanisms studied in the lab and in translational research and all the way to the multiple clinical studies he designed and developed and, and treating patients in these trials today. Graham will share his work after, after this talk. And I want to thank the Focus Ultrasound Foundation for helping us recognize Frank and, and, and keeping his spirit with this technology and this community and society. I want to thank the selection committee for their hard and diligent work in selecting the candidates. And thank you again for putting this venue together in experimental or non-experimental format. And we look forward for an exciting week. the slides. Thank you very much, Yal, and thank you, Neil, and the selection committee for this great honor. I'm, I'm really excited to be here in person with you all today. I remember coming to this first symposium many years ago and thinking about how exciting this technology is and what a great opportunity we have with the Focus Ultrasound Foundation and Neil Cassell's leadership really taking this technology into the clinical environment. And it's always been Neil's vision that the Focus Ultrasound Foundation is really about clinical translation. And while mechanism and understanding the biology of these effects is very important to designing the treatments that we'll see more about this, this week, I think that your vision, Neil, for, for taking us into the clinical environment is really what is uh, at the foundation of the spirit of, of this award and what uh, Dr. Joel Ensch was, was really working so hard to do up at Brigham Women's Hospital. So it's, it's again my honor to be here with you all today and thank you uh, again. Uh, I'd like to share with you some of the work that that we put together with the support of the foundation and in SciTech who are the, uh, uh, helped initiate this award. And so some disclosures, I don't really have any financial disclosures, but some grant funding and some clinical trials sponsored there, some by in SciTech as you can see. So this is a great team and Focus Ultrasound, as you all know, can't be done with just engineers or just clinicians. It really takes a large group of people and just, this is just a subset of people who have worked so hard to be part of the team that we have at the University of Maryland and in Baltimore. And uh, really started really with, with uh, Howard Eisenberg, who is the previous chair of neurosurgery, is here with us today, and his deep connection with Neil Cassell and his interest in image-guided therapy himself. And, and he and Elias Melham, who came to the University of Maryland from University of Pennsylvania previously, really helped found the team that really kicked this all off for us in a clinical uh, program at the University of Maryland. But it was also coalescing really nicely with where the company and SciTech was at the time in terms of the development of the technology. Uh, many of the foundational elements, again, started at Brigham Women's Hospital with Dr. Joel Ensch and uh, Claire Bohinanen and Nathan McDonald and a number of the others that are up there, Alex Golby as well. And so all of our work was really done in collaboration with this group. In addition, after Clairvaux had left Brigham and gone to the University of Toronto, the team expanded, and you can see some of the members of that team here near Lipsman and others who are, who are uh, still very intimately involved in this work. 
So when we think about neurosurgery and interventions in and around the brain, it really starts with uh, an understanding of neuroanatomy and imaging. Again, the foundation of what the, Dr. Joel Ensch was trying to do with the advancement of MRI. And in the early 1900s in this country, Harvey Cushing, you can see here, was sort of thinking about neurosurgery as its own specialty, as its own way of, of intervening with, within the brain and within the nervous system. And you can see there his relatively rudimentary light on his forehead for a transphenoidal surgery into the pituitary region deep within the brain, accessing that for the first time. And that was a highly novel, highly risky a way to kind of get at a very common problem, a pituitary macroadenoma. Fast forward to 2011, we, you know, we began to understand the brain in deeper ways with tractography, as you can see here, and being able to intervene with tractography using deep brain stimulation and other tools that allowed us to access these deep structures uh, from a surgical perspective. In addition, we also started to use endoscopes, uh, not unlike what Dr. Cushing was trying to do with that light on his forehead. We could take the light and actually put it closer to the pathology and visualize these structures with a high degree of resolution and then intervene in an even safer or more effective way. So around the same time, some of you may have seen this article in Time Magazine, maybe Neil Cassell saw this. But it, they, the editors at the, in the invention issue envisioned a, a coalescence, a merging of two exciting technologies, magnetic resonance imaging and ultrasound. And if these two could come together in some way, this could be truly life-altering, life-changing. And really, that is where the foundation of this award and what Dr. Joel Ensch's career was all about. It was about merging intervention with high-resolution imaging and intervening in a way that was more effective for patients, safer for patients, maybe even lower, uh, shorter recovery times, things like that, which are very important, especially in today's world. So again, in honor of Dr. Joel Ensch, as, as Yao mentioned, this was a true pioneer in the field of image-guided interventions. You know, we think about this now as commonplace. We think about endovascular procedures in neurosurgery. We think about stereotactic procedures for functional neurosurgery. We think about what we're all doing in the clinic now with focused ultrasound. This was all a highly novel and uncertain concept back when Dr. Joel Ensch was pushing it. And, and developing things like this National Center for Image Guided Therapy in 1995, uh, developing the concept of the Amigo Suite, Advanced Multimodal Image Guided operate, Operating Suite, that included not only MRI, but PET, CT, ultrasound, and angiography all in one suite. He became the, a member of the National Academy of Sciences and Institute of Medicine, and really was the first team leader of an MRI-guided interventional suite and, and program. And, and his real vision, as Yal mentioned, was about imaging the intervention in real time. So this is a picture, thanks to Nadir and Yal for providing this, of the first focused ultrasound treatment done at Brigham and Women's Hospital in 2005, an ablation of a GBM. And that really set off the work that really inspired me and what we're going to talk about today. Let's see if this will play. You guys have probably all seen this before. Maybe not. Maybe you can press play on that so people can see the... So as many of you know, this is the Insightech Exablate device and it allows over a thousand individual ultrasound transducer beams within a hemispheric array to be individually controlled and be uh, individually ad adjusted to that patient's skull to focus the beams to a, a desired site deep within the brain. And this is truly a revolutionary concept, the ability to have so many different energy uh, forms and energy uh, beams coming together, not unlike we use for uh, stereotactic radiosurgery, and other forms of intervention in and around the brain, but with ultrasound to be able to do this through the intact human skull and, and have the effect of, of thermal ablation with submillimeter accuracy was truly out, uh, astounding. And so this concept and the, and the approval of this device um, in 2016 for the, in the United States for the treatment of essential tremor really kicked off a, a whole new understanding of, of what the possibilities could be for steering ultrasound beams within the brain and having effects, not only thermal ablation, but potentially effects that are mechanical that could be, have, have a downstream impact on blood vessel permeability, as Dr. Kanafagu mentioned, or neuromodulation. And so when you take this idea of a subspot 
and the ability to target any, almost anywhere within the, the human brain a small subspot of energy and also measure at, in real time the emissions of, of ultrasound, acoustic emissions from that subspot, not only in the terms of understanding a temperature change that could be derived in that location, but also any mechanical feedback, whether that's resonance or, uh, or cavitation. And then take the ability to, to not only have one subspot, but steer the energy beam through a grid of subspots, almost like a 3D printer uh, here represented as a three by three grid within the brain. And in real time, steer through that grid, the energy beams in, in a, a, a very coordinated way and have a desired effect within a region of the brain as depicted there in the frontal lobe. So this is the concept of, of blood-brain barrier disruption at a lower power, but with circulating microbubbles in the bloodstream and activating those microbubbles in the bloodstream in real time and measuring the effects of those microbubbles. Here we can maybe play this video, not unlike the one we saw before. So here you can see circulating red blood cells and also small microbubbles, gas-filled uh, ultrasound contrast agents that are used in clinical practice for diagnostic imaging. And when these bubbles or are activated and uh, they attain a stable oscillatory pattern and expansion and contraction within the blood vessel that can temporarily disrupt the uh, connections between the cells that form the, the blood vessel. And this can lead to, as we all know, temporary blood-brain barrier disruption and vascular permeability. So this um, concept of using standard ultrasound contrast agents and, and, and a device that we know can have a high degree of control uh, within the brain really founded the, started the, the idea of starting clinical trials with this device for patients with brain tumors. So here's an example of the first patient treated in the United States with a brain tumor using this device. And what we wanted to do with this, tech, with this technology and with this trial was actually obtain tissue so that we could study the effects of the ultrasound in, in the actual tissue that was being disrupted. And so here you can see a patient that has a frontal brain tumor. It's a T2 hyperintense, intrinsically non-enhancing brain tumor that after focused ultrasound in a, one of those three by three grids that I showed you earlier, we can see in the far right image there on the MRI, the new contrast enhancement within that desired target. What that allowed us to do was to create a stereotactic neuronavigation sequence that we could use in the operating room to steer to and localize to that area directly and, and actually resect that area early in the surgery before there was brain shift or any other changes and, and actually visualize that with fluorescein dye, which we sometimes use in the operating room to visualize contrast enhancing tissues. And so here you can see that contrast enhancement within that target area uh, and then the tumor resected on the bottom right. So we also wanted to look at these tissues for the direct effects, some somewhat crude measure here with H&E uh, analysis of these different regions. And here you can see four different regions that were removed from a patient that had focused ultrasound and a control region in that same patient that did not receive focused ultrasound. And what you can see is that there's no significant change, even in areas where we saw some small T2 star changes uh, in, the, in the area of the target. So we also looked at some of the indirect measurements of the bioeffects of blood-brain barrier disruption in these, in these regions and indirect as measured by MRI. So we have contrast-enhanced MRI and also T2 star weighted imaging. And what we see is a correlation, an early correlation between the dose of energy that was delivered to a given target and the bioeffect, more so with the contrast enhancement, less so with the T2 star. This is an area of active investigation with some of our uh, bigger data sets that we have now from the other clinical trials. So the idea here is that you know, this is the type of patient that we really need to do something better for. This is a patient with a glioblastoma, the most common, deadly primary brain cancer. Uh, may maybe some of you have family members or friends who have had this disease, but the median survival for this disease is around 16 months. There has not been a significant change in the natural history or treatment for this disease in almost 20 years, and these patients are diagnosed and it's essentially a death sentence. So we need to do something more. As surgeons, we can take out that white contrast enhancing ball of tumor fairly effectively now. We have tools, technologies, both imaging and interoperative tools that allow us to do this safely. With brain mapping, we can preserve function. And, and that, that feels like we're doing something important for this patient. As you can see in the post-operative image, there's almost no intrinsic contrast enhancement remaining in this patient. Patients go on to receive adjuvant chemo and radiation treatment over the next six months or so. 
but often within 12 months, they, we start to see contrast enhancement within the two to three centimeter margin surrounding the original resection cavity. And by 17, 18 months, that contrast enhancement has expanded across the midline and the patient is not gonna live much longer. So the idea is after surgery, the brain may look like this on the MRI scan, a T2 hyper intense region around the original resection cavity with no residual contrast enhancement. And the target that we want to get after is this region where we know the tumor is most likely to occur. This is also the target for our standard of care radiotherapy, which is the two to three centimeter margin around that original resection cavity. So we came up with the idea of looking at this, can we open the blood-brain barrier both in the setting of upfront standard chemotherapy or in the setting of recurrent disease and give chemotherapy, a new chemotherapy called carboplatin, an, an agent that's used for other cancers. And this was the, the, the sort of the next phase of clinical trials that were initiated by the team from Toronto, Brigham, and Maryland. And so what we, what we uh, focused on here was the, uh, looking at the safety and feasibility of treating monthly um, in the setting of these standard or uh, um, adjuvant chemotherapy treatments. And, and that's what we, uh, we looked at in both the context of upfront and recurrent tumors. So the lingo for this is BT008 from Insightech and BT009. And here you can see the description of the, of the trials um, and the, the doses of ultrasound and the volumes that were treated in the first trial, upfront trial, we treated up to 65 uh, cubic centimeters. And then in the second trial with carboplatin, the, the dose uh, and the volume ex increased to about 110 cubic centimeters, so a large volume. So here you can see the enrollment of the, in these trials. You can see in the BT008 study, which the Brigham team treated uh, the last patient, the last cycle of the last patient uh, last week, I believe. Um, this, is, this is data from a few months ago. So this is a little bit, uh, a few more patients and treatments now. You can see a, a large number of, of total treatments in, in both of these studies, which has created a large amount of data to analyze for both safety, feasibility, and the potential future use of this technology. Here you can see the volume. One of the early issues that we thought about when we got to the point of having a three by three grid, which seemed quite small, one cubic centimeter, was could we expand this to a large clinically relevant volume, uh, such as 60, 100 cc's? And you can see here in both studies that we uh, successfully got to that volume, uh, thanks in large part to the Insight Tech team developing the beam steering capabilities and the power control um, that allowed this to happen in a very safe and controlled manner. So here's what it looked like in the early days when we could create slightly larger grids of energy that were or target grids and then deliver that energy within um, the, the, the peritumoral resection cavity. On the, in, the, in the first uh, patient, you can see a resection cavity there in the posterior temporal region. And then the energy delivered, what you see there is a heat map of the deposited acoustic energy over the course of that target, targeted treatment. And then you can see the new contrast enhancement in the region of, that, of those targets uh, adjacent to the resection cavity as designed. Uh, later on in the study, um, you can see a similar target region in the uh, area around that resection cavity. But what you can see there is a slightly larger uh, grid and, and target region. And what you can also uh, appreciate there is that the energy deposited is much more homogeneous and not as, as sort of heterogeneous and spotty uh, across that. And that's a, it was a became a major challenge and, and goal of the, of the trial was to advance the technology to be able to create a more homogeneous pattern of energy uh, deposition and to do that in, in the region of uh, tissues that are not uh, heterogeneous or that are heterogeneous and that have a, a very uh, um, a, a disparate amount of blood vessels throughout that area. So the microbial density within these areas may be also quite different. So the ability to create such a uniform treatment within this peri-resectional space was a huge advancement and really, uh, you know, credit should be given to um, Rafi and Eyal and the entire Insight Tech team that put this all together. So one of the real foundational elements of this technology is the ability to have a closed feedback loop control of the power cycling through a given target. So you can imagine that those 1,000 plus transducers are steering through this grid in a 3D printer-like fashion through the intact human skull and attempting to uh, deliver an amount of energy in a uniform way to that entire heterogeneous tissue target. So 
you know, that's quite remarkable to think that that's possible. But this is really how it's done. And you can see the black line there is the average power that's being delivered over the course of this uh, targeted treatment. But what you see in the colored lines is the power controller cycling through the, the, the different amounts of power to generate the desired effect based on harmonic emissions or acoustic emissions to a given subspot. So each subspot uh, experiences a slightly different power, all geared to achieve a given uh, acoustic emission pattern in, in that region. So it's a truly remarkable that this is happening on a millisecond level as a, as the system scans through the, the target that's drawn by the by the provider or the, or the proceduralist. So here's an example of what that can look like in real time as a patient is actually receiving a treatment. Maybe we can play this video as well. So what's happening here is we've drawn the target in that periresectional area of the GBM patient. And the, the energy is being delivered and cycled through the subspots. You can only see the average power, the green line on the bottom right there. But what you see also is the subharmonic intensity over time, which is the acoustic emissions feedback being delivered back to the system and allowing the system to, to uh, ramp and, and change the power to achieve a given intensity. And so over the course of this treatment, you can see the accumulation of that uh, cavitation or harmonic dose in the target region there on the MRI scan. And this is happening for the proceduralist in real time. In addition, we actually have the ability now to monitor any T2 star changes in real time all under the, uh, while the patient is receiving this treatment awake. And as I showed you before, this corresponds nicely and the degree of energy de uh, deposited within that target correspond nicely with the, the desired bio effect, the new contrast enhancement within that target region. So again, this is the, the vision and the hope is that we can now use this technology and treat with volumes in a reasonable amount of time with a high degree of safety in monthly cycles to deliver new chemotherapies, not only the standard chemotherapies like temozolomide, but new chemotherapies such as uh, IV formulations of carboplatin or immunotherapeutic drugs and maybe even some cellular therapeutics. This is now opening the opportunity for us for the first time to think about localizing uh, truly effective therapies in these areas where we know the GBM cells are most likely to take hold and recur. So I'll show this one last video, just putting it all together. Again, a new uh, chemotherapy here, again, loaded in purple there. You can see the blood-brain barrier disruption uh, in a similar way with the expansion and contraction of the microbubbles in the acoustic field. This allows the localized extravasation of the chemotherapy, which is in the blood vessel, into those tissues, as we've shown, can happen with both fluorescein dye and gadolinium contrast enhancement, and then delivering that chemotherapy to the region around the brain tumor. I still do think that it's gonna require a, a resection of the tumor to really make this effective, but again, that, that, that technology is also advancing rapidly in the surgical area. So this all, again, started with the vision of Dr. Joel Lynch and the, the team at Brigham, and uh, you know, has expanded now to many of us around the world who are working in a similar way with MRI-guided interventions and focused ultrasound. And I really think that we are at a critical next phase of this technology development and in clinical application where we have the ability to deliver the energy in different forms, thermal, mechanical, neuromodulatory, and do it with a high degree of precision and control with closed feedback loop uh, type monitoring. So again, thank you very much to the team and to uh, Insightech and the foundation for this award. And I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to be here with you all and to continue the conversation around this exciting technology. Thank you. Thank you.